Hello everyone, welcome back to day 10 of Polity Daily Drill. Let's begin. First up, which of the following statements regarding Article 142 of the Indian Constitution is incorrect? So you can pause the video and take an attempt at the answer. So Article 142 talks about how Supreme Court can perform something that we have come to know as judicial activism. So what does this mean? This article states that the Supreme Court has the power, the authority to ensure complete justice in any case, any matter that is pending before it, even if it includes cases outside the ambit of law, which makes the first statement actually correct. In fact, this Article 142 combined with Articles like 32 and 226 for the High Courts makes this entire concept of judicial activism viable in the country. And yes, this is also seen as the absolute power of Supreme Court, where Supreme Court can, in order to ensure complete justice, take up any case and pass any kind of order on any matter. So one is correct. Yes, it empowers the Supreme Court to exercise its jurisdiction and pass orders for doing complete justice in any case or matter pending before it. Coming to the second statement, the exercise of power under Article 142 by the Supreme Court is limited to the territorial boundaries of India and cannot extend to Indian citizens abroad. Now, if you read the statement, just to clarify, the statement that Article 142's exercise is limited to the territorial boundaries of India and cannot extend to Indian citizens residing abroad. Now, this is a bit misleading because the Supreme Court's jurisdiction under this article is not expressly limited by geography, at least in the text of the Constitution. The focus is on doing complete justice. So nowhere is it mentioned that there is some kind of territorial restriction, which seemingly makes this statement incorrect and possibly our answer. But let's read the other statements as well. C. Under Article 142, the Supreme Court can grant relief even if there is a statutory provision contradicting the relief granted, but it cannot legislate. Yes, that's true. Of course, it does not give the authority to the Supreme Court to legislate, to make laws. Why? Because lawmaking is the domain of the legislature. But yes, it can strike down statutory provisions, of course, under Article 142. This is correct. And the fourth one, Supreme Court has utilized Article 142 to fill legal voids by providing guidelines in the absence of specific laws which are binding until the legislature enacts a law to that effect. This is true. A very good example is Vishakha guidelines. So Vishakha guidelines, which were made in 1997 by the Supreme Court to prevent sexual harassment at workplace, were the only guidelines for the next 16 years Till a law was made by the parliament in 2013. So D also is correct. Supreme Court can give judgments to fill legal voids by providing guidelines. Hence B is the right answer, which is the only incorrect statement. Moving on to the second question. Consider the following statements regarding cabinet committees in India and identify the correct ones. CCs, cabinet committees are extra constitutional bodies that derive their existence from the rules of business of the government of India. Now see, as far as the CCs are concerned, under Article 77 Clause 3, the President of India can make rules for the allocation of business and also for the convenient transaction of business. So, the Cabinet committees are framed under these rules, the Government of India, Transaction of Business Rules of 1961. And yes, 
they are extra constitutional in nature statement one is correct coming to number two the prime minister has the exclusive authority to both appoint and dissolve all cabinet committees without requiring approval from the president of india now see the first part is correct but think of it while the pm forms and leads the cabinet committees decides on the nomenclature number of members the people who are members etc the authority and the procedures involved are not as unilateral as the statement suggests and there is no direct involvement of the president in their formation or dissolution that's true but the process is governed by <clears throat> administrative convenience the administrative convention and what is that the administrative convention is that the president makes rules so stating that without requiring the official approval of the president would be incorrect hence two is the wrong statement third one the cc on security is the only committee explicitly mentioned in the constitution of india now we know this is wrong the cabinet committee on security like all cabinet committees is not mentioned or defined in the constitution these are extra constitutional bodies hence three is wrong and the fourth one cc's are instrumental in reducing the workload of the union cabinet by dealing with subjects of a specialized nature this is of course correct why see one of the primary functions of cc's is indeed to reduce the workload of the union cabinet they allow for detailed analysis discussions etc on complex issues making the decision making the process more efficient so one and four are correct two and three are wrong which of the statements given above are correct right answer is a one and four only moving on to question number three a question on ncm no confidence motion which was introduced last year in the monsoon session so consider the following statements about the no confidence motion in the context of the indian parliamentary system again you can pause the video and mark the answer now let's see firstly no confidence motion is mentioned under rule 198 of lok sabha rules so this is not something you will find in the indian constitution and this particular motion is meant only to be introduced in the lok sabha why lok sabha because as per article 75 clause 3 the council of ministers are collectively responsible to the house of people that is the lok sabha hence this motion can be brought in the lok sabha only because the government formation takes place in the lok sabha only now first one it can be introduced in either house to express a lack of confidence in the council of ministers second part is correct the reason why it is brought is to express a lack of confidence in the council of ministers meaning that the house feels that the government no longer enjoys the majority in the house but the first part is wrong because it cannot be introduced in either house but only in the lok sabha so of course one is wrong for an ncm to be admitted for discussion it requires the support of at least 50 members of the house this is correct whenever you want to give notice for introducing an ncm 50 mps of the lok sabha have to sign it number 3 if an ncm is passed the council of ministers must ideally resign from office this is also correct see whenever an ncm is passed the expectation is that the government since it has lost the majority in the house must resign now it is not mentioned anywhere that as soon as you lose the ncm you have to resign there is a possibility that there might be some government so shameless that they lose the majority and still say i won't go they start crying rolling on the floor etc then the president might have to come in and kick the ministers out and that's an extreme situation but ideally they would resign and uh, fourth one part 5 of the constitution mentions the procedure for an ncm now as i said earlier part 5 or part 6 or 
any other part of the constitution does not mention the procedure for ncm because no confidence motion is not mentioned in the constitution part 5 though deals with union union executive legislature ordinances the supreme court and the cag but does not mention no confidence motion fourth one is wrong so how many statements given above are correct b only two are correct moving on to question number 4 with respect to the legislature of the national capital territory of delhi consider the following statements first one the chief minister and other councils of ministers are appointed by the lg and number two the strength of the council of ministers is fixed at 15% of the total strength of the assembly now as far as the provisions are concerned you can find them for nct of delhi under article 239 double a now if you look at the provisions here and compare it to the states in general you might have an assumption that both the statements seem to be correct why because the cms of the states and the council of ministers are of course appointed by the governor but sadly that's not the case for delhi the cm and other ministers are appointed not by the lg here but by the president of india this is mentioned under clause 5 of this particular article and again if you refer to article 75 article 164 for central and states again the maximum limit of the ministers in the council including the head the pm or the cm should not cross 15% of the strength of the lower house that is either the lok sabha or the assembly but again in case of delhi this limit is not 15% this limit is 10% this means both one and two are wrong and what's the answer the answer is not d because the question says which of the statements given above is or are incorrect so please always read the directives carefully you just have to devote 5 seconds to reading the directives and that cl clarifies and also ensures that you do not mark incorrect those answers that you know very well right so in this case since both statements are wrong right answer is c both 1 and 2 and the fifth statement consider the following statements about article 19 of the indian constitution the freedoms guaranteed under article 19 are absolute and can be restricted by the state only during a national emergency now we know very well that article 19 and other articles especially their right to move to court can be restricted except 20 and 21 during a national emergency however otherwise as well rights in our country are not absolute we can impose reasonable restrictions on these fundamental rights so is the case for article 19 article 19 clause 1 sub clause a provides us with six different rights then we have clause b clause c d e g so these are the six different rights that are provided through these clauses a b c d e and g f has been repealed and corresponding to each sub clause that is for 191a if you look at article 19 clause 2 you find restrictions on this for b clause 3 for c clause 4 for d and e together clause 5 and for g clause 6 so there are plenty of restrictions on article 19 and also other fundamental rights so we can't really claim that these are absolute in nature so one is wrong second one the right to strike is explicitly protected under article 19 as a fundamental freedom again there's a problem right to strike 
is not mentioned as a part of Article 19. It derives its authority, its source from a law called Industrial Disputes Act. So there is a law of 1947 called the Industrial Disputes Act. Under this law, there is a section 2 clause Q or subsection Q which actually defines what's a strike. So right to strike can be seen as a statutory right but cannot be claimed to be a fundamental right or freedom. So 2 is also wrong. This means both the statements are wrong. Which of the statements are correct? Neither 1 nor 2. Right answer being D. This brings us to an end of our discussion for today. Let's meet tomorrow. Till then, that's all for me. Jai Hind.